So last week, um, I told you um, that no one at the 9 a.m. had laughed about my comment uh, emphasizing uh, the, the wife pleasing her husband in light of St. Paul's words, but we already covered that, I believe, uh, by this Mass because I was able to uh, come, uh, come up with my additional commentary. Uh, however, I do want to add that I failed last week in speaking about the saints of the week to note that Friday was the feast of saints Joshua and Gideon, the successor of Moses and one of the judges, but more importantly, of holy Anna the prophetess, who was herself a widow and who exemplified the many virtues uh, and practices that I was speaking about last week, which it was very hard for me to see that there were a number of widows, widowers, and other uh, elderly single people who did step up their work uh, for the Lord last week a little bit in prayer and coming to Mass and helping with St. Teresa. So that was very uh, good to see. The modern feast of St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Gregory the Great, Doctor of the Church, is today. Uh, he is, while he was the mon uh, abbot of a monastery prior to being made Pope, had uh, 30 days of masses successively offered for a monk who had died after a grave violation of his vow of poverty. The monk, after these 30 days, appeared to a brother and told him that he had been freed from purgatory, and this is the origin of the Gregorian masses for the dead. We commemorate Holy Moses, the prophet, on the 4th, and St. Teresa of Calcutta on the 5th, we commemorate Holy Zechariah the Prophet on the 7th, and of course we celebrate the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the 8th, as well as that of Father George Eliot and Deacon Andrew Smith, obviously nine months after her conception. The, one of the antiphons for the feast day says, Today is the Nativity of the Holy Virgin Mary, whose glorious life is the ornament of all the churches. Finally, the Feast of St. Peter Claver is on the 9th. His entry in the Martyrology reads, In New Carthage in South America, St. Peter Claver, priest of the Society of Jesus and confessor, he devoted more than 40 years with wonderful mortification and exceeding charity to the service of the Negroes who had been enslaved and with his own hand baptized in Christ almost 300,000 of them. Pope Leo XIII added him to the list of the saints and then declared him to be the special heavenly patron of all missions for the Negros. Now, let's go back to St. Gregory, though, for a moment. I mentioned, as I've mentioned with a number of saints, that he is a doctor of the church. And as I'm giving this series on the saints, I wanted to pause for a moment today and comment on what that means, what, are all, the, what all the titles of the saints mean. A doctor of the church uh, is a title given since the Middle Ages to certain saints whose writing or preaching is outstanding for guiding the faithful in all periods of the church's history. Doctor, etymologically, from Latin means teacher. It's not principally one who heals. Etymologically, it means a teacher. And so these are the teachers of the faith that are for everybody. And who are they? Well, the doctors of the church are St. Albert the Great, Alphonsus Liguri, Ambrose, Anselm, Anthony of Padua, Athanasius, Augustine, Basil the Great, Bede the Venerable, Bernard of Clairvaux, Bonaventure, Catherine of Siena, Cyril of Alexandria, Cyril of Jerusalem, Ephraim the Syrian, Francis de Sales, Gregory the Great, Gregory Nazianzus, Hilary of Poitiers, Isidore of Seville, Jerome, John Chrysostom, John Damascene, John of the Cross, Lawrence of Brindisi, Leo the Great, Peter Canisius, Peter Chrysologus, Peter Damian, Robert Bellarmine, Teresa of Avila, Thomas Aquinas, Teresa of Lisieux, John of Avila, Hildegard of Bingen, Gregory of Narek, and Saint Irenaeus. The rest of us are merely tutors. If we want to learn, then we should want to learn from the best. And if we want to teach, we should teach with only the best. And the doctors of the church are the best teachers, hence their title. Now, 
While we should certainly be hearing of these doctors from the pulpit, even if we don't, we should be doing our own study. And so I wanted to offer some thoughts on the subject of reading, and particularly from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, everything that I'm saying is expanded uh, much more substantially and something else you'll find in the gift shop as well. But before saying any more, just a very practical request. Please put your name in your books so that when you forget them at church, which sometimes happens, we can get them back to you. I don't just hoard them, so it would be nice to be able to get them back to you. So there's three particular points I'd like to make today to focus on regarding reading. The rest you can read in my little book. First, reading is essential for our souls, not in the sense that you can't go to heaven without reading, not in the sense that you can't uh, provide for your families without reading, but we're not supposed to be shooting for the minimum, we're supposed to be shooting for, for, for perfection, and we need all the help that we can get. God has given us an intellect like his, he has given us language in order to communicate thoughts and ideas, and therefore it would behoove us to use that language and this gift so that we can learn from these teachers and writers of the holy faith. So please read for yourselves. Please teach your children to read, especially in this culture of damn cell phones. Uh, and please take that very seriously. Again, obviously, I'm, I am encouraging reading in general, but we want to focus on spiritual reading for the purposes here. Sola Scriptura, that error that we only read the Bible and therefore interpret it for ourselves is not the Christian approach. The scriptures are inspired word of God and you should be reading your Bibles. But that is not the only thing you should be reading because it is both arrogant and insane to think that every person is going to reap, reap from the scriptures everything equivalent to what the church has gained in her experience of 2,000 years. While you should be reading scripture, there's no reason to be reinventing the wheel. You need to learn from those people who have already walked the walk and have shared those things with us so that we can learn from them. It's not being lazy, it's being efficient, and it's being prudent. And finally, it is essential that you read things published before 1960. The revolutionaries of the church have been largely successful in cutting us off from all things before the Second Vatican Council and their interpretation of it. It has never been the case in the church that supposedly new things contradicted what came before. The church grows organically. Everything that is legitimately believed and practiced is a fruit of what Christ planted in the church. And if it is not from that, then it is not a legitimate fruit. And cut off from the roots, the tree is going to die. And yet, and yet that is what we have seen in our lifetimes. The majority of Catholics accepted the propaganda uh, that the church changed in ways that she is not capable of changing, really. Obviously, on the surface, that's possible. So for this, because of this confusion, you have to read for yourself. You need to know what the consistent belief of Christians has been, otherwise you will be swayed by the opinions of contemporaries. And there are many false teachings in the church that are very common today. Do not trust Pope Francis, Bishop Strickland, Father Bolin, and sadly, many grandmothers. You need to read and study for yourself. Now, insofar as your shepherds are in consonant with the Christian tradition, that's great. But they're not who you follow. You follow Jesus Christ. You, you follow the guidance of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the example of the saints. And they are the ones that show us what it means to be a Christian. And if anything in your experience as a Catholic is not consonant with that, then it's not Catholic. They give us the examples to follow, and the doctors of the church in particular, to learn from. So we'd be very foolish not to do so. The Holy Catholic faith is the fullness of truth. The Holy Catholic faith contains all that is good, and the Holy Catholic faith is the single most coherent and unified body of knowledge 
that is able to address any of the questions in the universe. And the Holy Catholic faith is beautiful. So for the love of God, for the love of your neighbor, and out of love for yourself, please study it.